All right, we've got another word problem. And I, I wanna attack this the same way we did example 12. And so if you remember, there's the first question you should always ask yourself, right? We wanna figure out, are we in mean land or proportion land? That's one version of the question you could ask yourself. Or you could say, do I have a numerical variable or a categorical variable? Okay, so we called this question one last time and you can do either version of it, right? You can go this way on it or this way on it. I, I, I'm fine with either either uh, version of that, but we're trying to figure out what land we're in. And then when you get done with that, for all of these A through, we got F in this case, let's try and figure out, are we on a population distribution or a sampling distribution? Okay. And we saw that when you were in mean land, right? If you were in mean land, you would um, set up your little X and X bar with all the question marks, all right? So let's take a look at this. As we read through this, be on the listen for which land you're in, if you can spot it that way, or even potentially what your variable is, okay? So going through this, let's see. It says the article should pregnant women move, linking risks for birth defects with proximity to toxic waste sites reported that in a large study carried out in the state of New York, approximately 30% of study subjects lived within one mile of a hazardous waste site. Let P denote the proportion of all New York residents who live within one mile of such a site and suppose P equals 30. Okay, so just based on that, I think you can see there's a couple, there's a couple of things giving you clues. First of all, you heard me kind of pause a moment when I saw percent. As soon as I see percent, I'm in proportion land, okay? So that would be my first clue that I was in proportion land because I had a proportion, right? The units were percentages. I would argue the second clue was the fact that they gave you the letter P, right? That is a proportion, that's a parameter, all right? And then I saw the word proportion, that's another great clue. And then they redropped the P, but with a number this time. So those are, three huge clues that you are in proportion land. So let me go ahead and write that in the margins. I'm in prop land, okay? And then I can infer from that that I, I must have had a categorical variable, right? So what was my variable? What did I ask these New York residents? I asked them, do you live within one mile of a hazardous waste site? So whether or not resident, oh, technically New York resident, excuse me, uh, what did they say, toxic or hazardous, hazardous waste site. So when they say this article is, should pregnant women move? They don't mean like, should they walk around? They, they mean like literally, should you move away from this hazardous waste site? So this is categorical, right? Because yes, I either live within a mile or no, I don't. And it looks like their, their success in this case, we're keeping track of the ones who answered yes. So who do live within a mile? All right, so we're in proportion land, which means we're not really, well, not even, we're not really, we won't be looking at population distributions. We will only be looking at sampling distributions. So that's, that's the plus side of proportion land is that you are only going to be in this column. You won't be jumping between a population and a sampling distribution. It's only this, but the downside is this, right? That normality, it is always a beast to calculate. So let's see if we can figure some of this out now. When you're in mean land, you had to do the three X's. When you're in proportion land, so let me put, I don't know, let, let me put a little note here. All right, if you're in proportion land, you wanna figure out which, which number was your parameter 
and if they gave you a different one, which one was your statistic? And build your sampling distribution off of your parameter. So build sampling distribution from your parameter. All right. So instead of the six question marks, we got to find our P because whatever our P is, we're going to put it here for our center. And when we calculate the standard error, we're going to put it here, here, and then we'll use our sample size. Okay. All right. So let's see our, our P, they straight up gave it to us. It was 30%. All right. So we'll, we'll start to build this. It says, what are the mean and standard deviation of the sampling distribution for proportions based on a random sample of size 10? Okay, so in this case, I know n equals 10. I'll keep that in mind, and I know p was 0.3. All right, or you could write it in the other order. It doesn't matter, but it says what are the mean and standard deviation. So when we talk about mean, the mean in and itself is p, and the standard deviation or the standard error is square root p, 1 minus p over n. So let's fill this stuff in. So the mean of my sampling distribution is 0.3. And the standard error of my sampling distribution is the square root of 0.3, 1 minus 0.3, and our sample size was 10. Oops, not n, 10. All right, let's see what that number is equal to. And what was our p? 0.3, 1 minus 0.3 divided by 10. It looks like about 0.145. Okay, so let me write this down. Okay, so I'm happy with that. All right, so there's the answer to part A. Now, if we move on to part B, it says, let me scoot that up a bit. All right, so we're getting asked, would sample proportion, would the sample proportion based on a random sample of only 10 residents have an approximately normal distribution? Explain why or why not. All right, if I wanna assess normality, we've got the central limit theorem for proportions, which has nothing to do with the central limit theorem for means in terms of how we check it. All right, so I need NP greater than or equal to 10, and I need N1 minus P greater than or equal to 10. And then we'll start looking at if the sample size is small relative to the population. But all three of these things have to be checked off before I can drop the N on the sampling distribution. All right, checking for normality is always a lot more annoying in proportion land. All right, so let's, let's go through the first one. Is N times P greater than or equal to 10? All right, so I had my sample size of 10, my sample or my population proportion of 0.3. When I do 10 times 0.3, maybe you can do this in your head, maybe not, no worries. 10 times 0.3, we get the number 3, which means if I had a random sample of 10 New York residents, I would only expect that three of them would live within a one mile of a hazardous waste site. And while that's all fine and good, the problem is this is not greater than or equal to 10. All right, so as soon as one of those three assumptions fails, the answer to this question is no. All right, no, the sampling distribution is not approximately normal. Okay. And then I'm back to the that question of I don't know what the shape of the sampling distribution is. I don't have any information on that. So then when you look at a question like part C, when it says, hey, can you calculate this probability? The answer is like, sorry, I can't, right? I can't do this problem. I cannot do this calculation. Okay. And the reason is the same as before. I can't, I don't know the shape of the population distribution so I can't be using normal CDF. All right, 
I should say I do not know the shape of the sampling distribution. Excuse me. So basically what happened for us is we had the sampling distribution. We put the question mark there. All right, we knew the mean was 0.3 and the deviation was about 14.5%, but that question mark is what's jamming me up here. I don't know the shape of the sampling distribution, so I can't do anything. Okay. So we run into uh, not meeting the normality assumptions when the sample size isn't large enough. And 10 residents in this particular instance was just not large enough. So now we're gonna redo this problem, but we're gonna really bump up that sample size. So you see now I'm jumping up from 10 and I'm gonna head into 400, right? So I've really increased the sample size. Uh, variability will decrease and we're gonna hope that's enough to be looking at a normal distribution. So let's see if we can do this one now. So it's still saying what are the mean and standard deviation of the sampling distribution for a sample of 400. Well, the mean of this sampling distribution is still gonna be 30%, but the standard error is going to change. So the standard error is gonna be the square root of P, one minus P, and my N this time out is 400. All right, so I'm gonna have a much smaller number. Last time I had 0.145 or 14.5%. This is gonna be a lot smaller. I don't know how much smaller, but 400 is quite a big jump from 10. All right, so my last standard error, you can still see it there, was 14.5%. Let me redo this, but let's change this to 400 now. And you can see how much that variability decreased, right? I went from 14.5% to about 2.3%. So I'm gonna write this here as 0.023. Okay. All right, so I've got my center and my standard error. If I was keeping track so far, I got the question mark here. I'm at 0.3 and I got 0.023. All right, so we're coming back down to kind of put the end there. We're gonna check for normality. There are three assumptions that we basically need to get through. So I need to see what is n times p, what is n times one minus p, and then is the sample size small relative to my population? I'd like to be able to check through all of those things. If I can, if I can say yes, yes, and yes, I can drop the n here, and then I can calculate this probability. All right, if any of these fail and I can't put the end here, then I can't do this problem. So, so let's see. All right, so we got 400 times 0.3. Let's see what that would be equal to. We're looking at about 120. All right, that is definitely greater than or equal to 10. Now let's do the complement to that. I'm just gonna put in 0.7 because the complement to 30% is 70%. We're getting 280. That is also greater than or equal to 10. I'm gonna put a check mark there. And, and those are by far the, the two most important of the assumptions. I would call these, not I, everybody would. These are the deal breaker assumptions. All right, if this assumption is not met, that's when you would stop the problem. The sample size small relative to the population, it's ideal, but it's not a game changer. All right, and again, when I talk about that more in chapter eight, uh, I'll explain a little bit more. But this is the normality assumption. So if we can't say these two things are happening, we, we really can't put that in there. And uh, this is just more, well, it's ideal. Okay, so what this is saying is if I had a sample of 400 New York residents, I would expect that about 120 live within a mile of a hazardous waste site and about 280 do not live within a mile of this hazardous waste site. All right, now sample size small relative to population. Here's how we check that. Take your sample size, 400. We're gonna use the 10% rule. All right, so we're gonna go 4,000. And we were sampling New York residents. All right, I would say it's safe to assume there are more than 4,000 New York residents 
Okay, so let me put it is safe to assume there are more than 4,000 New York residents which does make our sample size small relative to our population, because if our population is all of the New York residents, 400 is a really small subset of that. And what this is allowing us to do is sample without replacement, because theoretically for our trials to be independent, I would need to sample with replacement, but it just doesn't happen in the real world. So all three of these things are met. So I can put the N here. So the answer to this question is, is yes, all right? Yes, my sampling distribution is approximately normal. All right, I'll put another happy face because again, now we can do part F. So let's figure this out. I want the probability that if I talk to my sample of 400, what's the likelihood that between 25% and 35% would live near a hazardous waste site? Well, let's go normal CDF. Our low is 0.25, our high is 0.35, our mean was 0.3, and our standard error was 0.023. All right, so let's see what we're working with here. A pretty large proportion, right? We got about 97%. And even though I didn't put the graph here, I didn't have us draw the bell curve, we could kind of, well, we could kind of, we could definitely approximate it. So let me just scoot the page up so we've got this hanging out here. And let me just draw real, real fast to make sure that my graph would match what I think should happen. So, ooh, that is my bell curve by hand. All right, the mean would have been, what, 30%? And if I even go up one deviation, this would be, what, 32.3%. Let me go down one deviation, and forgive me for not being able to do this in my head, but 0.3 minus 0.023, I'm at 27.7%, so 0.277. So you can see if I really wanted to go from 25 to 35, I'm gonna have to take over a pretty good chunk of my graph, right? There's 35%, there is 25%. All right, and I again, I don't do the greatest job graphing by hand, which is why I usually put the bell curve on these. All right, but you can see that's a pretty large proportion or a pretty large chunk of the area under my curve, which is why that number wound up being 97%, right? And this, if I was gonna label this, this is the proportion of New York residents living near a waste site. Oops. So my, my graph, my, my quick and dirty graph is matching my number. All right, and so with that, that brings us to the end of chapter seven. So we've got both of our sampling distributions under our belt at this point, right? So we've got the sampling distributions for averages and the sampling distributions for proportions. Keeping in mind that checking normality is much easier in mean land than proportion land. And these two methods are totally different. Here's the six question marks. Here's find your, um, build your sampling distribution around your parameter. All right, and then decide, yes, I can use normal CDF or no, I can't. All right, so with that, we're gonna wrap up chapter seven. Thanks, gang, bye.